I'm so pleased that Professor Jackie Dunkley Bent, our Chief Midwifery Officer for England, is able to be with us. And I know her time is very pressured because she's she we've all been talking about women and midwives juggling things. Well, Jackie is ju juggling just about everything and doing brilliantly for us. And I just want to say I'm so pleased that we have a chief midwifery officer. So I'm, I'm just going to give edited highlights of Jackie's um, CV because it's available online and I want and I know you'll want to hear more of Jacqueline speaking, not me. So if I just say Professor Jacqueline Dunkley-Bent, OBE, Chief Midwifery Officer, NHS England. She's got vast experience in healthcare provision. She's been just about everything in midwifery from clinical midwife to midwifery manager to midwifery educator to professor, consultant midwife. Um, and now here she is here. And uh, or also curriculum leader. I didn't, didn't pick that up. I apologise. And her experience has seen her leading and influencing national maternity standards and guidance. She also influences healthcare nationally and internationally through education and public publications and is frequently invited to speak at national and international conferences. I would also say she's influenced the fact that in many countries now, people are realising actually midwifery is important and we need a chief midwifery officer. So she's responsible for that too. So she has m so many awards and uh, her BME Pioneers Award, HSG Award, and has been on the NHS, NHS Nursing Times Leadership 2015 list celebrating nurse and midwives who are pioneers. She is our pioneer. So welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for joining us. And the screen is all yours. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sue. And um, also uh, to Neil Stewart et al for this amazing conference. And one of the benefits, I think, of, of a platform like this is that if you are busy clinically or if you can't watch or listen or engage um, real time, you can do this at other times. So that is fabulous for such a time as this. So delighted to be with you all, albeit virtually um, on the screen. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Dunkley-Bent. I'm the Chief Midwifery Officer for the NHS in England. And as I say, delighted to be with you. Um, so we're going to go on to the next slide. And so we have, uh, we have and we still have many plans, of course we do, and every time we plan, be that for work, be that for a social occasion, when we're planning, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and the day after. We can make really great plans, line all the docks up in a row, dot all the I's and cross all the T's. And that's what we did with Better Births, as you can see, we're four years, we're five years into a five-year programme. We were four years into a five-year programme when the pandemic started. The NHS long-term plan, the people plan, and so many other initiatives and plans, working with phenomenal partners. And you can see all the partners there working hand in hand, keeping our finger on the right pulse. And the right pulse was the pulse of women and their families, women, babies, and their families. That's where the heart of everything that we wanted to do, that I want to do as the Chief Midwifery Officer for England. And my ambitions, and my ambitions remain um, very clear, ambitions to strengthen leadership of our amazing profession, perceptions of midwifery, so changing the perceptions of midwifery so that people know, the public know, uh, women know, and indeed we're reminded of the fact that if you have a midwife, you improve outcomes for mums and babies. And, uh, and so my ambitions go on, leadership, perceptions of midwifery, and ultimately the foundational principles are England, to be one of the safest places in the world to be pregnant, birth and transition into parenthood. So all these amazing documents and more, because I'm thinking about our other partners, um, that was and continues to be the ambition supported by my ambitions as Chief Midwifery Officer. They were the plans. However, on the 30th of January, all our lives 
started to change and the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus um, outbreak a public emergency of international concern and more significantly for us on the 11th of March, um, a pandemic and our lives continue to be changed and our plans have to be refreshed and refocused, repurposed, um, and, and delayed somewhat. Um, so it, it, I, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about the best made plans and the pandemic. And you, more than anyone, is feeling that at the moment, wherever you are, wherever you happen to be, be that in clinical practice, education, research, leadership, management, strategy, policy, um, you know, consultant, whatever you're doing at this time, we are at a time that is totally uncharted territory. I work clinically myself, as many of you know. I've now moved my clinical base up to the Rosie in Cambridge, and I frequent that service um, uh, fortnightly. And I too have been in PPE, supporting women to have the best experience, because that's what we do as midwives, regardless of the context. So I'm going to move to the next slide. And I've actually had conversations with uh, midwives in, in recent time, well, over the last um, nine months, uh, seeking views, listening to experiences, receiving emails, direct messages on Twitter, um, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, Viber, ordinary message. And the, the key concerns and the key words spoken by midwives at this time, at this time, are and you can see there for yourself that the larger the font the more frequently the um the words were cited so i've probably spoken to about um 1,900 uh, midwives in total, uh, just seeking their views at different times and it, it's it's really quite difficult to embrace that burdened stands out at this very time in the middle of the pandemic. The question was, how are you feeling at this time? How are you feeling at this time? And the key uh, words, burdened, exposed, I would say, are the more and, and vulnerable, I think, anxious, depressed, lesser so. Um, we have an optimistic um, uh, uh, reference there, but nonetheless, we cannot ignore these, um, th these key experiences. And what I'd like to say to you is a big thank you for continuing at pace within this um, uh, um, uh, uncharted uh, territory to continue to provide the best care for mums and babies. I, my mantra that was handed down to me is to be my best, do my best and always do what's right. And I'm leaving that with you, um, despite your feelings of anxiousness, be feeling burdened, exposed. Thank you for being your best, doing your best and always doing what's right. And remember that you have professional midwifery advocates and others who can support you in this journey. So just wanted to say that in the first instance before we move on to what has the impact of this time um, done for, um, uh, what is the impact on women uh, what's the impact on babies and indeed what is the impact on our maternity services and so if I go back at the start of the pandemic um, if, if we think about how women and uh, their families were feeling we have anecdotal evidence that tells us that women were fearful of engaging with maternity services they were fearful because uh, they didn't they wondered how uh, if they would uh, uh, catch uh, COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus, uh, what the significance of that would be. Were hospitals places that were unsafe? Uh, were their communities more influential in how they engaged? We saw um, uh, many women choosing not to engage uh, when their intuition would normally tell them to come into hospital. So we had many people not engaging with maternity services, DNAs increased, uh, women engaged um, when uh, there was compromise with themselves or their babies instead of engaging in a more timely way. And people were generally scared. 
Uh, the impact on maternity staff. We had, you've seen the previous slide of people feeling fearful, uh, burdened, anxious, um, unprotected. We had challenges with PPE at the start of the pandemic. We had huge challenges and experiences from Black, Asian and minority ethnic staff that told us that they felt even more vulnerable because of the disparity in death rates uh, from COVID-19 amongst the Black Asian and minority ethnic communities and staff feeling fearful for themselves and indeed their families and their loved ones that they would go home to. So there were many, many challenges about PPE, about um, uh, test fitting, about appropriate um, uh, uh, PPE guidance and I could go on. You've felt it, you've breathed it, you've lived it, you know it. These were some of the real challenges also with our staff. Uh, we, we estimated that maybe 30% of staff may be away at any time, either shielding, um, uh, being taken away uh, from services because of track and trace, or indeed ill with COVID themselves or caring for loved ones with COVID. So again, the staffing challenges uh, uh, played a huge part in how we delivered maternity services. And suffice to say, service alterations were really significant at the peak of the pandemic. Our uh, amazing directors and heads of midwifery who were doing a phenomenal job, their deputies, their matrons and their other leaders working at pace to try and ensure that we could maintain safe services for all. And to do that, to maintain safe services for everyone, they had to then consider how they uh, uh, could provide that by, some had to, unfortunately, uh, suspend uh, home birth services, uh, suspend um, uh, services within freestanding maternity units so that we could, they could pull uh, midwifery staff so that everybody could be kept safe at a really challenging time. So we have much data about suspensions, about services, and indeed concerns and complaints from women and their families about their choice offer being reduced. I won't share the data at the moment, that will come in later times, but that's just a little bit of a, um, a, a national picture for you in terms of how COVID did impact and continues to impact on women, babies, their families, maternity staff, and indeed, how we provide our maternity services. So moving on to the next slide, we're also guided by data. It's really important at this time that um, we have evidence um, and data, intelligence-led data that helps us to know the size of the problem so that we can fine tune um, our interventions and initiatives to meet the needs of women and their families, because this is what we are all about. So the UCOS study, which uh, was absolutely phenomenal um, in their work to produce these data. So I'm only sharing with you published accounts. Of course, we've got data um, that tells a different story to what's on the slide. Um, uh, the, the data uh, now is very different to what's on the slide, but I can only share with you at the moment published data. So they considered the outcomes of pregnant women and their babies admitted to hospital. And the, the time frame is between the 1st of March and the 14th of April. So you can clearly see that things would have changed um, since then. But nonetheless, at that time, 427 pregnant women were admitted to hospital. And you can see the rate there. And that this at the time was the largest population-based cohort of pregnant women had admitted to hospital with COVID-19. We'll move on to the next slide. And, you know, in relation to mothers, what was the impact on, on, on mothers um, who experienced uh, 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 COVID-19? And uh, just a point of note, because um, again, thinking about intelligence-led data, a point of note, what is meaningful right now to mums and babies and to you, for mums that are fearful about using our maternity services. Key point, pregnant women are at no greater risk of severe illness from COVID-19 than the non 
pregnant population. That's really um, a, a, a significant point um, to raise. Pregnancy is not associated with increased mortality, um, unlike flu. We know uh, the data in relation to uh, population that die from flu every single year also of significance that I'd like to point out to you. you many of you know this already, but it's a, a point worth re-emphasizing. 55% of pregnant women admitted to hospital with coronavirus were from a black, Asian and minority ethnic background. If you were black, you were eight times more likely to be in hospital with COVID-19. And I'm speaking in the past, this is now current to Asian women four times more likely to be in hospital with COVID-19. So you can see why the anxiety and the fears presented themselves from women, but also from Black, Asian and minority ethnic um, uh, staff. And so there is something about um, a higher risk of severe disease uh, given uh, infection among vulnerable groups. There is also something about the comorbidities, which we know of anyway. So moving on to um, the next slide. In relation to babies, UCOS told us a little bit about the morbidity and mortality associated with uh, babies that uh, were COVID positive. In, an interesting point of note is that 74% of women gave birth at term despite having COVID. And um, the transmission of COVID-19 to infants was uncommon. Nonetheless, we have mortality data and that has increased um, as the months have gone on. But I can't share that data with you just yet. So we have an impact of COVID um, on mums, pregnant mums, and also on babies. And suffice to say, I should have mentioned um, in the, um, when I was speaking about staff, about you, about your colleagues, your friends, about all healthcare workers, we have lost healthcare workers to coronavirus. And for every single one of those, and in particular, obstetricians and midwives who have lost their lives to COVID, we stand here united, together, still pushing forward, protecting ourselves, supporting ourselves to do the best that we can for mums and babies. Maternity is an emergency service, so we can't turn the lights off and close the doors. We are 24-7 and we will continue to be that. So for everyone that's lost, that have lost their lives, to COVID-19, we stand in solidarity, pushing forward, supporting each other to do what's right for mums and babies. Next slide, please. In relation to data, we also have the Embrace UK um, rapid report findings, also published data, because I can't share with you um, uh, the unpublished, but also published data between March and May. And again, uh, uh, Embrace UK rapid report emphasised that pregnant and postpartum partum women do not appear to be at higher risk of severe COVID-19 than non-pregnant women. And again, uh, sadly, of the 10 women recorded at this time, so look at the date, you can see the date, uh, recorded at this time who died with a COVID-19 diagnosis eight of them uh, uh, died as a result of this. So seven of the eight were from a black Asian minority ethnic background. That's the point I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. So again, there is a disparity and inequality in outcomes for women who experience COVID. And that will resonate with some of you when we think about previous Embrace findings regarding uh, morbid mortality for black, Asian and minority ethnic mums. I don't need to rehearse that back to you. The five times more likely, um, I think is in the heart and minds of everybody that is providing maternity services at the moment. So moving on to findings two um, from the um, Embrace Rapid Report. Uh, there are key mitigation actions Embrace refer to. So the, the need for senior obstetric review, um, the need for MDT um, uh, a review on a daily basis, perinatal mental health is so significant. We know that the calls and, uh, to domestic violence services um, hotlines um, have increased and continue to increase. So the, the perinatal mental health space, keeping people safe is really significant at this time and will continue to be as we ride this storm.
So key interventions, we're already familiar with the social distancing, um, et cetera. And also the advice to stay at home we believe and Embrace believes was overemphasized. Um, and I've shared with you the impact of that in relation to what women did with that information. So moving on to the next slide. So what did we do at NHS England Improvement with um, feedback from your heads, directs of midwifery, matrons, leaders across England? What did we do? We co-produce communications for women and families. Um, but there's a whole Help Us to Help You campaign. There are um, coronavirus leaflets in 11 different languages. There's a film, there's animations. We teamed up with uh, uh, Best Beginnings to re-emphasize um, some of their key messages. And in recent times, well, I would say in the last three months, uh, Matthew Jolly, who's the National Clinical Director, the doctor half of me, wrote out, Matthew and I wrote out to maternity providers and asked them specifically to focus on four key interventions for black, Asian and minority ethnic women. No longer can we look at these data and be immobilised. So whilst we've got um, many initiatives about uh, uh, reducing inequality in health outcome, we've got two years of information and intervention. Um, this particularly is in the COVID space, the so four key actions. And, and you can see them for yourselves, but there is something about um, lowering the threshold to admit and refer um, to multidisciplinary teams for black, Asian and minority ethnic women that present with symptoms. Let's not explain away symptoms to your pregnant. Let's think about this intelligibly. Let's listen to what the evidence is telling us and let's refer on. Um, also, um, communication that is tailored to meet the needs of Asian mums, minority ethnic groups, um, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged groups, black women. Also, the vitamin D conversation must be had. And um, so midwives are in, a, in an optimum position to have that conversation about vit potential vitamin D deficiency, particularly for women that are non-white or cover themselves um, uh, because of religious reasons or other reasons when they're, when they're outside um, uh, in sunlight or non-sunlight, as, as, as I would say, but in, the, in um, out exposed. There is something about having a conversation about vitamin D deficiency and also accurate recording. I mentioned that data is significant and intelligence-led data is even more significant to help us to be very specific and focused with our interventions. So moving on to the next slide, we also worked really hard with our um, uh, 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 websites and uh, embraced some of the initiatives from Embrace in terms of the red flags, um, messages call your midwife or your maternity team immediately. If we work, we have worked with the RCOG and the RCM who have produced um, uh, uh, guidance at pace week on week to help us, you, our services keep abreast of keeping everybody safe at this challenging time. Also, um, organisations like Five Times More Likely, Chloe and Tanuke, who have done a phenomenal job engaging with women so that we can understand um, where they are, step into the context of where they are so that we can be more purposeful with our interventions so that they can engage appropriately and timely with maternity services. Next slide, more of, of, of the same um, information co-produced with parents um, you know, on my Twitter um, uh, uh, feed at the moment, I've pinned a video of um, uh, encouraging pregnant mums to engage. It's a tiny video, but nonetheless, it's quite significant. And that will remain pinned until we see our way through uh, this pandemic. Next slide. So, so in summary, um, you know, I can't overemphasize this. Pregnant women are at no greater risk of severe illness. That said, I have to say with this uh, new variant, we are seeing increasing numbers of pregnant women um, uh, um, who have become ill as a result of COVID-19. So uh, this is um, legacy data. 
these data that I'm sharing with you are from er the earlier part of the pandemic. Um, so we, we, we can't be complacent. Um, uh, but there are other things that we need to do all the things in relation to social distancing, PPE, education, advice, encouraging women to engage and also supporting each other to keep safe so that we can keep our maternity services safe. In relation to all those plans I mentioned right at the start of the presentation, better birth, the long-term plan, all those things, they will be linked into the recovery plan, but we can't recover our plans until we see our way through this pandemic and that requires you that requires us that requires me to stand united together supporting each other as I've said I'm out on the front line not as regularly because I have the day job my deputies are out on the front line the chief midwives we have seven chief midwives across England one per region they are doing a phenomenal job so there are seven of them there are two deputy chief midwifery officers and, and myself and we are working with you we stand in solidarity with you and we engage in the clinical picture we put ourselves working alongside with you clinically because it's significant for us to be able to then when we step into our day jobs lead with authenticity so on to the next slide I think it's really, really important to have a moment of reflection, even when we are moving at pace, even when we are exceptionally challenged. Um, I think it's important um, to reflect. And if I may, um, there are many quotes, aren't there? There are so many famous quotes and, and, and quotes that people use all the time. But the one that has sat with me for the last few months is this one, it's Kamala Harris. And my day, she says, my daily challenge to myself is to be part of the solution, to be a joyful warrior in the battle for the soul of the country. My challenge to you is to join that effort. Let's not throw up our hands when it's time to roll up our sleeves, because years from now, this moment will have passed and our children, our grandchildren will ask us, where were you when the stakes were so high? They will ask us what it was like. I don't want us to just tell them how we felt. I want to tell them what we did. And in this COVID space today, as midwives, uh, maternity support workers, professions allied to medicine, obstetricians, neonatologists, anaesthetists, and everybody that supports our maternity services to be the best that they can be, our academics, our researchers, policy strategy, uh, Neil Stewart, Sue McDonald, all of us, all of us together, what are we doing in this space? Now, we might not be battling for the soul of our country, but certainly there is something about, are we throwing up our hands um, and complaining? <laughs> or are we rolling up our sleeves and sorting this issue out, being the best that we can be, riding this storm? I know things change on a daily basis, but what we can do is be our best, do our best and always do what's right. And from where I'm standing, looking um, uh, at England um, in its entirety, looking at each maternity services and um, the work that is being undertaken at pace, at speed, people pulling things out of the bag. Um, I think from where I'm sitting, you are, we are, being our best, doing our best. And I believe that we will always do what's right for mums, babies and their families. Next slide. So just want to say thank you for who you are and for all that you are doing right now. We don't underestimate the challenges, of course we don't, but I know you've had a great day today. Um, Sue reminded me that I had a hard act to follow and that was somebody called Molly, who was speaking about um, a pelvic floor. Um, that is one of my um, uh, uh, pet subjects. So when I was in education, I, I, I put 
um, my students through their paces in relation to pelvic floor, pelvic floor exercises, perineal repair, etc. So I know you've had a good day, not just from Molly, but from other speakers as well. And I hope that you can take valuable insights from today. And if you're listening tonight or if you're listening next week or next month, take valuable insights from the speakers from today and share the word, share the positive messages with your colleagues, because in these dark times, in these challenging times, everybody needs a green shoot and a pearl of wisdom. And you can do that for your colleagues once you've listened to today, if you're not listening now. For those that have listened throughout the whole day, take those green, green shoots back to your colleagues. So thank you very much. And um, we are in this together. We stand united together. So thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you, Jackie. As always, a wonderful sort of um, a huge, well, it's a huge run up of all the work that's been going on. And um, I've been very conscious of when you were talking about the things that midwives have been doing over the last few months when we've done our maternity hour and some of the heads of midwifery and the educationists have shared what they've been doing. It, I think midwives have risen magnificently to do so many flexible and innovative things. I guess that's what we need to hold on to now and feel the teamwork and the togetherness that we have as a profession to support mothers and their babies and the families, obviously, whole whole lot together. So thank you so much for making the time to be here. I know you're incredibly busy and I should think at the moment you're on little roller skates to go to the next activity in your diary so many many thanks Jackie and we'll look forward to welcoming you back at maybe when things are settled a little bit I don't dare almost don't dare say that but thank you so much thank you thank you very much